are live on Twitch. Let's wait for this to pop. Uh, we're good. Okay, 236. <clears throat> are you ready? Where's all yep. that? Say? Okay, three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 236 of the Security Podcast here on the N30 Network. My name is Haim Cohen. Tom is over there. There. Hi. There. there. Okay. And today we're going to talk about why you should use free open Wi-Fi because apparently free open Wi-Fi is the new hotness and that's all you should be doing. Yeah, clearly this encryption thing was just a fad. It's blown over, and uh, free public Wi-Fi is here to stay. So, I mean, you're you're probably screaming at us right now, but <laughs> yes, literally, the EFF posted this uh, this month, January twentieth or January twenty twenty, saying free uh, public Wi-Fi is a lot safer than you think. And I know it goes against everything that we've been telling you for the past uh, many years, but they have a point and not to say that it's, it's completely un, uh, impenetrable, but it depends on what you're doing. And so the, basically they're saying with HTTPS anywhere and all the sites going TLS and, uh, and Chrome and Firefox and all the anti-phishing and anti-malware things, it's not as as, as dangerous as what we've been saying for the past few years. Yeah, like, uh, you know, HTTPS is pretty ubiquitous now. Yeah, there's a, a couple edge cases here and there. And, and frankly, you know, when Chrome and Firefox make the updates and finally make HTTP, you know, really hard to use and, and practice on the open web, uh, then we're going to see a lot more HTTPS, which is great. But the fact remains that, you know, open or, or closed Wi-Fi, the sites you're going to are already encrypted with really stellar encryption. Um, so, yeah. Uh, now, is open Wi-Fi great? It's, it's not the best. Like, should you take off your passwords on your Wi-Fi? No. Should you use your hotspot if you're used to doing that versus connecting to the public airport network? Yeah, it's probably better to do that. It's probably better to, to choose the private network. But are you going to get 200 different viruses immediately and get your, your bank account hijacked and uh, your, your flight sent to you know somewhere else that you didn't plan on? No, no, it's not going to be that dire. And uh, frankly, uh, a lot of the websites have caught up now. So yeah, this is a good thing. If you just wanted some history, uh, it gives. We're going to put this in the show notes, but it talks about uh, Let's Encrypt and the reason Let's Encrypt started uh, was basically in 2010. A Fire Sheep was this app that would uh, that makes that basically gave you this like Facebook looking thing on different people's uh, cookies. That it was basically Fire Sheep was stealing the cookies on the open on the open Wi-Fi. And it would let you log into people's uh, Facebook accounts, Yahoo accounts, MySpace, or whatever was active in 2010. And that scared a lot of people. So uh, the, somebody created uh, Let's Encrypt, and then the EFF helped, and a whole bunch of people came up with it. And it, slowly but surely, websites have been encrypting their or putting certificates on, not to not to be secure, but to send the, to send the encrypted tunnel. So that basically took Fire Sheep out of the question and took a lot of other stuff because every website now you're going to is is at least uh, encrypted. So so you're not worried like data is not leaking. I guess that's the point. Yeah, yeah. So Fire Sheep was great. Uh, I remember uh, playing around with Fire Sheep with a couple of my friends, having one of them log into their Facebook account, and me just sitting there on Firefox clicking the refresh button, just waiting for stuff to come across the wire. And sure enough, there we go. I had their cookie. I was logged into their Facebook account and I was posting embarrassing messages in their name. Um, now, Facebook and a lot of other websites caught on. They started sending cookies only over HTTPS. Uh, but it took a while for all the stragglers to kind of shake out. Like Fire Sheep was active and relevant for way, way longer than it should have been, uh, which made for great fun showing people, you know, how security works in a computer and why encryption is important. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Fire Sheep was awesome. But today, you know, just like you're saying, HTTPS is pretty ubiquitous. And public Wi-Fi, thanks to HTTPS, isn't actually all that dangerous anymore. Um, now, the EFF does point out a couple of things. You know, what if you have a weird, uh, like, local network 
exploitable vulnerability in a piece of software that can only be exploited with stuff on your same network but not across the internet for whatever reason then yeah you're definitely exposing that risk to the other people on the network um you know nefarious or otherwise uh but the best defense against that is something we've also been saying for years and so is the eff just keep your stuff up to date run the patches run windows update do your ios updates have stuff just automatically update all your apps um and you know that kind of thing is going to be a rarity you know will it happen will zero days happen will there be somebody popped on a public wi-fi network yes absolutely but isn't going to be an everyday occurrence is the risk going to be just crazy wild no no it's going to be fine look i've even at this point taken off https everywhere so but just backstory http https everywhere is an extension that uh, the ff made that basically will force your traffic over a secure channel if the website has it but nowadays every website if you type it in it sh- it's automatically chosen https so I-, I basically took it off because if it's not secure both browsers will give me a huge pop-up that says not secure not secure be careful so I, I don't remember the last time I went to something that was not secure by by choice. I mean, internal network stuff I have, but other than that, and it's even hard now to find non-secure websites to test because apparently when you connect to an open Wi-Fi that has a captive portal, it has to be run on HTTP. And to do that, to initiate it, you need an HTTP site and there aren't any HT, HTTP sites. So there's, I, I think there's one. There's a- yeah, there's one. It's like it's never SSL or something like that. Yeah. It's it's the only guaranteed place on the net that will not have SSL. I think example.com might work as well. And by the way, if you haven't been to example.com, you should go there. It's quite literally an example web page. It's safe for anyone to use. It's it's run by um, you know, I, I want to say the IANA. Um, I could be wrong on that, but it's it's basically run by an, in, an internet consortium agency to serve as quite literally just an example site that you can put into documentation or uh, example screenshots or anything like that. So you don't have to give away real domains or real addresses. So yes, I just went there. It is by IANA. It is not secure. I got the not secure pop-up. Um, and But yes, it is a website that is not encrypted. So if you're trying to connect that has a captive portal that you have to log into or accept some agreement, you can go here to test it out if it doesn't automatically pop up, which is yeah. <clears throat> now again, we're not saying now, now this is now if you're on the DEF CON open network or if you're at a place where hackers gather where they're trying to sniff your data, maybe an airport in, I mean, this is not the best thing. So if you do have LTE, if you have data, if you have some other method, that's fine. Um, but it's like we said, it's, nowadays it's a secure uh secure browsing with tls is actually fairly safe now i'm going on a cruise in the fall where i get free wi-fi so me and my four thousand closest friends are going to be sharing one net- network again it's it's good to have if i'm trying to do something but if i want something more we do want to talk about some vpns yeah so um I know you've been playing with some vpns recently according to our whatsapp group that you should totally join by the way uh, so tell me tell me about your your wild adventures with uh, with your Raspberry Pi and your VPNs. First, I offended Tom in so, in some major capacity a few weeks ago, <laughs> about a week ago, and we got over it. But anyway, so my place of work does not allow VPNs, and this has been a bone of contention for many years because I'm in a concrete building that has literally no cell phone service. Yes, even with Verizon, there is no cell phone service. So it doesn't matter which one you have. I don't want to hear it. I want to make, I have Verizon and I have no service t-shirts. But anyway, they the I, my IT department basically bought a box that said, uh, what would you like to block? And you just check off everything. VPNs, check. So it blocks it. And whatever box they're using is doing a really good job. So I started with OpenVPN and OpenVPN is blocked. And Tom said, try a different port. So I tried it on 443, which is, which is uh, the, the HTTPS port, so it shouldn't block it. Uh, we tried it on different ports. Nothing. Nothing's working. Uh, I even have, I don't know, one of those paid VPN services that we'll talk about in a few minutes, 
and it worked, but only with TCP traffic, not UDP traffic. So I was kind of getting around it, but they also configured their access points wrong. So every time you switched access points, it would drop you and it would have to do this huge, massive hand check again. And my VPN would go crazy. Um, Cloudflare 1.1.1.1 1 .1 .1 .1 on Warp Plus, that's their like proxy thing that we'll also get to. That worked, but that's paid. You have to, after every gig, you have to pay $5 or whatever it is. So I'm running out of options because WhatsApp is blocked. And I go to IT and I say, hey, can I get WhatsApp? And they're like, WhatsApp what? We're Americans. We don't use WhatsApp. What is this WhatsApp that you talk about? <laughs> what is this communist chat platform? Like, why aren't you using an iPhone? Like you just want more green bubbles in your life. And I'm like, but you don't understand. Like you allow Facebook messenger, just allow WhatsApp for the rest of us. Like, I don't get it. So they, they didn't do it. So it's, it's a pain in the neck. So I got this one dot, I got this Cloudflare v, uh, VPN slash proxy going. But anyway, then I heard on security now, which is another podcast that we do recommend and listen to. It's a little long winded about WireGuard and WireGuard is just an alternative to open VPN. And it's like, it's basically like open VPN without the cruft. So, so we'll get to that. So I go to, I follow all the directions and then I get stuck and then I start getting mad. And the end result was I uh, port forwarded wrong, which is always a problem, but I got that right. And magically, like my world opened up. I'm at work and it just works. The handshake works. It works over the stupid disconnecting of the access points. I get everything. I'm on all day. I install it on my uh, my 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 work laptop, and that works. So now I'm like, like I can do whatever I want. Nobody's gonna stop me because I'm connected to some random IP. That when they block that, I'll just call my ISP and have them change it, or I'll just do some dynamic IP and be done with it. But uh, yeah, so I did that. WireGuard is magical. So to to give a little bit of background on on VPNs and why why we're going to really officially recommend WireGuard over OpenVPN. It's that OpenVPN was a great product for its time, um, but it just hasn't really kept up. Uh, it's got a lot of baggage. It's got a lot of cruft. The code base is pretty complex. It's, it's kind of, I don't want to say atrophy. It does the exact opposite of atrophy because it's software. It, it grows in weird ways and it's got like, odd spaghetti code in weird places it's just it's not it's not pretty to look at and it's not pretty to hack on <laughs> so uh, wireguard is totally new new kid on the block been around for only a couple years um but already it is doing incredible things with vpns now when open vpn was created People were just worried about getting their computers to VPN out of a network somewhere, or connect to a different network. That's the only thing that people were concerned about. There wasn't this big push to have always connected mobile devices where tunnels can drop and reestablish at the drop of a hat. Uh, so when you establish a tunnel with OpenVPN, it does a complicated handshake and it takes a while and uh, frankly, it just kind of drags on. Uh, we need something faster. We need something that would survive mobile networks, survive tower to tower connections, survive, you know, getting into an elevator at work and then losing all connectivity and then popping up not on a cell tower, but on a cell tower and Wi-Fi and then picking the right direction to go. Uh, so WireGuard was built in the modern era to solve modern problems. And by all accounts, it is. Uh, it, it has become such an impressive project that it actually was added directly to the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel now and its very latest iteration has support baked in for WireGuard connections. This is super, super cool. And so, well, again, like you said, OpenVPN uh, started as this project that will allow all this stuff. So it had to take in every, every bit of legacy code. And I mean... You're familiar with this if you're running Windows. Windows takes all this legacy code and all these things that are hugely, hugely either popular or whatever it is, but as soon as they die, instead of just saying, you know what, we're not supporting this anymore, go move on, they left it in and they left it in and they left it in. They keep on leaving this stuff in, which is a good thing for old applications, but... <clears throat> Here's the thing. I have a new phone. I have a new computer. I want, why don't we, why don't we migrate? Why do we have every single um, uh, encryption algorithm when we only need 
four, five, six, maybe. We should have a few. Uh, we're, we should be moving to elliptic curve at this point. And, and so WireGuard took that. And it was so much simpler to set up compared to OpenVPN. So I'm setting it up and I'm having this problem because I have an old Raspberry Pi and it just what I had to compile it. The directions were simple, but it wasn't working and I'm getting mad, whatever it is. So I said, fine, let me go back to uh, our, my favorite, pyvpn.io. I type in pyvpn.io and it's like, would you like to install WireGuard? I'm like, yes, let's do it. It took. 10 minutes to install compared to OpenVPN, which had to uh, do the, the cryptographic handshake, which took sometimes like 12, 13 hours. It said, this will take a long time. Go do something else. Come back later. Yeah. And it magically did it. And the app worked. Like you could take a QR code and it spring and it puts the details in. So with OpenVPN, you had to download the OPVN file, install it on your phone, put that in, you had to make a client for each one so you can be on simultaneously. And if there was a problem, you had to destroy it and recreate it, which was another problem. Here it's, here it is, and I found the problem and it's like, hey, would you like to edit this? And I just magically edit it right on the app. And, and it's, I wanted to change the IP from my IP, a static IP to a, a dynamic IP. And I was able to do it and magically, like it just worked. Like everything was just beautiful about it. And, it's it, it it just worked and the only negative is that if it doesn't work it doesn't tell you that it doesn't work it doesn't say not connected it just shows connected so the um some of the cool technical details behind why OpenVPN takes so long and why WireGuard is so quick uh, is that OpenVPN is relying in its default mode you can configure this because OpenVPN has got an incredible number of configuration options, which it's good for some people, but not really good for ease of setup, as you've seen. Um, OpenVPN by default is using RSA. Now to generate those secrets and some strong keys, it takes a while. It takes a long while because uh, it's, it's doing a lot of heavy math. And uh, luckily, elliptic curve cryptography is actually really, really quick math and somehow way, way stronger. Uh, it's, it's a weird dichotomy and security where something is way stronger and way better but also faster and easier to run at the same time it's like this unicorn software that just never happens it's like a once in a lifetime event maybe twice uh and so you know with WireGuard using elliptic curve it's super easy to be like okay well we're going to choose these points on the curve and there's your math we're done it doesn't have to generate giant, you know, 4096-bit modulus files to extract stuff from. Like, it literally just picks a couple points and calls it a day. So, look, so I've been really happy. So my recommendation is uh, you can go buy a Raspberry Pi. They're not $35, whatever it is. You can hook it up to your home network. Uh, you can run the pyvpn.io script, which which we've spoken about is a little nerve wracking, but again, it's all open source. They literally walk you through. We are now going to type this command into your command line. We are now going to type this command into your command line. We are gonna do everything. And it says, would you like to do this? And it gives you the options. And it says, we recommend this, we recommend that. So if you just follow their recommendations, it all works. And 15 minutes later, you have this. They give you really simple directions. You could take a QR code and everything works. now. Now, if you wanted OpenVPN, you can do it. Uh, OpenVPN is, st is still probably supported by most other things. So we're not really off op um, uh, OpenVPN yet. But if you want to try something new and, and go through it, it is try WireGuard. I think you will be very happy. Yeah, if, if your devices support WireGuard, and by the way, most devices support WireGuard to some extent at this point. Uh, if your devices support WireGuard, don't don't look at OpenVPN unless you've got unless you know your use case and you know that WireGuard isn't going to fit it um, because OpenVPN is is fine software but uh, to be honest the the code is large enough and the code base is complex enough that there could be issues there right complexity breeds security vulnerabilities and WireGuard in comparison is relatively simple. Um, it's as far as VPN software goes, right? Like this software isn't 
isn't super trivial, right? You're, you're not going to be able to write WireGuard if you're just starting to learn to program uh, or anything like that. But when you compare the two code bases side by side, there's a lot less nooks and crannies for stuff to hide in in the WireGuard code base than there is in the OpenVPN code base. Now, we're talking about OpenVPN and WireGuard. There's still two other platforms that we don't recommend you use. Uh, is it, and I'm going to forget them, PPTP and IPsec. Yeah, so point-to-point -point tunneling protocol is it's basically dead, uh, which kind of is unfortunate in a way because almost all operating systems support it. Windows XP had point-to-point -point tunneling protocol support built into the operating system. That's how old this thing is. Um, and IPsec, it can be fine, but it is really, really easy to misconfigure IPsec or configure it in a way that you can hurt yourself. So we don't recommend that. So, I mean, if those are your only options and you want to do it, that's fine. Uh, but like we said, now the next thing is, well, I think we we, jump, we bury the entire lead. What is a VPN? I, I mean, I think we should have started with that. Uh, that's, that's probably a good point. <laughs> so we talked about all of this and we didn't talk about why we need this. And we talked about it in the sense that the school blocks it. So the VPN is just this encrypted tunnel between point A and point B. It's it just this tunnel. It doesn't provide, and Tom's going to explain this, it doesn't provide anonymity, but it provides encrypted traffic. So all the... If people is, are watching what you're doing, all they're seeing is that you're connecting from my, from your device with your IP to this other device. They don't see anything part of it, what's inside it or anything like that. So it, provide, it provides the security layer there. And again, everyone's trying to break it. And that's why you have all these different encryption standards and everything else. So it just creates a tunnel. It does not provide anonymity, which people think it does. It just provides the, the security that you can do all this. Now, again, if we talked about this at the beginning of the show. If you go to HTTPS, Google.com, they see that you're at Google.com, but they don't know what you're searching for. If you're on HTTPS, Facebook.com, they don't know what you're looking at, but the assumption is you're on Facebook. So the VPN will say you're connecting to this endpoint, but they don't know necessarily what you're doing inside of it. Right. So let's say, let's say you want some delicious iced tea, but for some reason the iced tea is blocked on your network. A VPN is quite literally this obfuscated tunnel that you can put traffic into one side and pull it out the other side without anyone knowing what's happening inside here. Now, just like you said, you can see both ends really clearly. You know that point A connects to point B. So, you know, is it is it secret? Do you know that somebody's using a VPN? Absolutely. There's two points in a, in a straw, right? You can you can see the tunnel, um, but you can't see what's inside it, and that's the important thing. Now, why people get this confused is that a lot of these commercial VPN providers claim to provide you anonymity, which is kind of almost true depending on the provider what they do is basically it's quite literally a cup full of straws and what the vpn provider says when the cops come knocking is they say i i don't know man there's a whole lot of straws in here anyone could have drank that tea and that's where you kind of get some anonymity now it's not perfect and there are definitely ways to figure out well that guy was sucking on his straw really, really hard. So we know that he pulled this, roughly this amount of data out. So we think it was that guy. Uh, and there's a couple different things with traffic correlation that you could do. Uh, but the, the fact remains that something like PyVPN isn't going to make you anonymous, right? It's, it's not going to hide the fact that you're using a VPN. It's not even going to hide the fact that you've connected to one. Uh, what it is going to hide is the stuff that happens inside the VPN. And so I, that's what I want to do. And you've heard this Netflix blocking different content. So if you can, if you can show that you're in a different country, you get that country's content. Like if you're in the BBC, if you can uh, get to get to great Britain, you can see BBC stuff again. They're not hiding. They're not hiding who you are. They're just saying that this is who you're connecting to. And so that's what people use it for. People say that Netflix is faster because of the geographical location barriers or anything like that. But fine. For me, I'm just trying to make sure my office doesn't know what I'm looking at 
whether it's because I want to, because I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing or because I just don't want them looking at it, which is usually the case. In my case, I want to be on WhatsApp and they block it. So this is their way of saying we don't know. Um, it's, again, it provides the security inside of it. They know that what I'm doing could be wrong and they can block it tomorrow. I don't think we're there yet. So one, so one really common trick that I use nearly every day, uh, T-Mobile loves to throttle video traffic, absolutely loves throttling video traffic. You'll click on a YouTube link and it will sit and spin for years, man. So what I do is when somebody sends me a YouTube video to watch, I fire up my VPN app, I connect to home, and then I look at my delicious, delicious YouTube video of Ice T through my VPN straw. And because T-Mobile can't detect what's inside the tunnel because they don't know that it's video content, they don't throttle it. Which means when everybody else on the bus is getting their Netflix at 240p at like three kilobits per second, I'm watching the 720p stream directly on my phone because it just works. So, so VPNs. And now, again, they know that my endpoint is my house. So then the next thing is you have are, uh, what's it called? Commercial VPNs. And we've said on the show many times, it's very hard to recommend one because they're all trying to sell you something. So we can talk about different types of things, but we're going to run out of time. But if you're going for through the commercial route, I would not use a secure, I would not look at it as a secure is secure enough to do what you want unless you really have done the research. Basically, they're all good enough. My one that I use, uh, you can contact me in the WhatsApp group. I'll, I'll tell you the name, but I don't necessarily recommend it if you're trying to do something you shouldn't that you really need to be secure for because I have a feeling some state actors have the endpoints and we go from there. There are others that are are. I would recommend moreover, but again, we don't know. We always hear stupid things that this one logs stuff that they shouldn't have, or they hard coded a password or whatever else. But the good thing about commercial VPNs is you can end in a different country without really having to worry too much. And it just works. If there's a problem, they'll fix it. There's a lot of servers, whereas my Pi is only in one thing. So if my house power is off or I can't connect to it, I'm kind of stuck. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, commercial VPNs have their place, but uh, you know, like you said, I don't know that we can uh, we could recommend any specific one, or even recommend against specific ones. Like, it, do do your research, and especially research whether or not this provider has been known to turn over data to law enforcement. If they have, generally a red flag because it means that they are logging exactly what happens on those wires. It's just it's. Uh... Like I said, I, I paid for a lifetime one that gets me out in a pinch. It's I'm I'm okay with that. Like I said, when I'm going on the cruise and that works, I'm going to use it because I just want to secure my traffic from the other people. I don't want them to see it. When I'm at DEF CON, I'm not worried about, I'm not worried about that stuff. I'm just trying not to get hacked at DEF CON. Uh, when I'm at my when I'm at work, I want to connect to my house because I rather run everything through my house, which is easier. Now, the other good thing about routing through your house that we didn't really talk about is that you're local on your network. I don't have to port forward anything else out because I'm literally inside my network. Where is so if I want to access my file server or whatever else, that is a really cool feature that I do not have to put on the open internet. <laughs> yeah, I, I keep a, a whole lot of systems and data and stuff just internal to my own network and being able to VPN in just to access something, whether it's whether it's a file or a, a video or even just SSH into a system and start a long running job because I forgot to before I left for work. It's amazing. It is fantastic. It's literally my home away from home. It's I mean, because I remember when I set up my whole network a few years ago, I asked and I said, I asked you and I said, what should I do? And you said, no, no, just VPN and you'll be much happier. And I really am. So instead of putting my 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 NAS on the open internet and trying to, to secure it that way, I just don't put it on the open internet. I VPN in and then I can do whatever I want, which means that I don't have to worry too much about the security on the inside because you have to get inside first. So I make sure that getting inside is very difficult. And then from there, it's the security is a little lax because, again, I have family members who like accessing these things. I, I, I can't imagine having to tell them, oh, we're going to use uh, public private keys to make this work. Just uh, all you have to do is hand me your SSH public key and I will make sure you get access to the NAS. 
say what now? <laughs> My what key? <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for the day when I ask somebody for their SSH public key and they hand me their car keys. That's really what I want. Well, I want it on the YubiKey. Here's my YubiKey. I want my, my oh, that'd U2F. Be great. I mean, that that's I guess that's the best way. But it's just it's it's I, I learn I learned this configuring network is so difficult. So you want to make it as easy as possible. And if WireGuard is gonna if thirty five dollars for Raspberry Pi and WireGuard, which is dead simple to install, and makes this all work, and I just have to port forward one thing, which <laughs> that's the thing that tripped me up. I am so happy because then I don't have to push anything. I don't have to use UPnP. I don't have to do this. And guess what? I'm I can now be at WhatsApp at work, and it makes me happy. So until they block that, I'm gonna continue doing it. And if you have any questions at all, we do have a WhatsApp group. So uh, jump in, ask questions, whatever you want. So anyway, we are over time, so we're going to end now. And if you have any again VPN questions, let us know. But that's the quick overview, and we will see you next week. Bye, everyone. See you, everyone. Oop. Okay, we're done. Yeah, we are done here. Yeah. We could have split that into two shows. Yeah, well, I will. I will kill Twitch.